The 2019 Florida Legislative Session is now complete. Tonight, we have members of the local Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation here to give us an inside look at what was accomplished. We are live and interactive on radio and on television. From the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio, it's Legislative Review Dialogue with the Delegation. This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. A very pleasant good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Jeff Weeks. In addition to our television broadcast on WSRE television, we're also being heard on News Radio 92.3 FM and on AM 1620. All in all, one might say the 2019 Florida Legislative Session went rather smoothly especially considering there was a new resident in the governor's mansion. Governor Ron DeSantis seemed rather comfortable in his role as Florida's new leader. Some lawmakers and operatives argue that his effectiveness and success during this year's session came from his willingness to have a more collaborative approach with the legislature. So how will the outcome of the 2019 Florida legislative session affect you, the constituents of Northwest Florida? Tonight's legislative review is an opportunity to find out. This is a forum for you to ask your legislators questions about issues that most concern or interest you. You can do so by email or phone. The email address is questions at WSRE.org or if you prefer, you can call us at 850-484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. We are joined by members of the Northwest Florida Legislative Delegation. Senator Doug Broxson serves District 1. He is chair of the Banking and Insurance Committee. He is also on several other committees, including Military and Veterans Affairs, Space and Domestic Security. Senator George Gaynor serves District 2. He is chair of the Committee on Finance and Tax. Senator Gaynor is unable to join us this evening. And now from the Florida House of Representatives, Representative Mike Hill. Representative Hill serves on the Agricultural and Natural Resources Subcommittee, the Civil Justice Subcommittee, and the Judiciary Committee, among others. Representative Hill represents District 1. From District 2, Representative Alex Andrade. Representative Andrade serves on the Commerce Committee, the Workforce Development and Tourism Subcommittee, and the Energy, Uti and, the Energy and Utilities Subcommittee, among others. We're usually joined by representatives J.R. Williamson and Mel Ponder, but due to scheduling conflicts, they were unable to be with us this evening. I will point out Representative Williamson serves District 3. He is chair of the Government Operations and Technology Appropriations Subcommittee and vice chair of the Workforce Development and Tourism Subcommittee. Representative Ponder serves House District 4. He is chair of the Children, Families and Seniors Subcommittee and he is also Majority Deputy Whip. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us. We're great to see you again. We spoke earlier in the year. Had a nice time down in Tallahassee. You're back, so thank you. Let me begin and I'll start with you, Senator Broxson, and get each one of you to answer this question. Sort of give me a high level view of how you thought things went for the 2019 Florida Legislative Session. Well, first of all, I have to give great appreciation to our president, Bill Galvano. He said it would be a member-driven process, and it was. He allowed every member uh, chairmanship, I know personally from my chairmanship, to run the committee according to what was good in the eyes of the member. Uh, I think the overwhelming concern that we had as a delegation was Hurricane Michael, and we were able to get $1.8 billion primarily for debris removal and really was waiting on the federal government to do their part. And we'll talk about that later, but that was a concern. Triumph uh, came into the conversation about the money. Should it be used for direct storm reimbursement? And uh, I think we, we properly uh, vetted that that should not be the, the case. Right. Representative Hill, your view. I thought overall that the uh, session was a success. Um, we had a, a session where our main responsibility is to pass a balanced budget and we did that 91.1 billion dollars so uh, that and we were able to pass a number <coughs> of what I would say were conservative uh, measures 
um, because we do have a Republican-led House, um, Senate, and also our governor. So we're able to get a number of conservative measures that were passed. Um, and there were some measures that were, of course, controversial that I think we're going to be talking about sure. a little later. But overall, I thought it was a good, successful uh, session that we had. Representative Andrade, it was your first go around, your first rodeo down in Tallahassee, so to speak. How was it? It was, and I would describe this session as bold. I think that was probably the, the adjective used most uh, regarding what we did. We, especially in the Florida House, we passed uh, bold reform in health care and higher ed and tax reform and criminal justice. And uh, I couldn't be prouder that this is my first session over there in Tallahassee. Well, let's get to some of the viewer questions here. Let me begin by talking about something that was uh, somewhat uh, controversial to say the least. Let's talk about the ban on sanctuary cities. So I'll begin with you, uh, Senator Broxson. Well, I think there's a lot of emotion around that issue, but it's a very simple issue. If a person is in jail or been accused of a crime, do we have a moral obligation to notify our federal partners? Now, I don't, I don't know how that can be as complicated as we made it. I think the House debated it for two days uh, with a lot of emotion. The Senate, we got through it fairly quickly. But uh, we, we have to be accountable for people that come to this state. And if they're for, from a foreign country and they're not acting right, uh, it's the federal government's responsibility to take care of them. And it's our responsibility to notify them where they are and if they're in trouble. Right. You would like to expand? Uh, yes. Well, Senator Broxson called it a moral responsibility, which I agree with, but it was also a legal responsibility that we have. Um, the debate in the House that became so contentious was that we were going to be taking people who might break the law for something as simple as a speeding ticket, or, and, and that we would take them and deport them from the country and, and, and take them away from their families and so forth, which is, of course, the furthest thing from the truth. Essentially, what we were saying was that if a person has committed a crime and they've been detained, then it is our legal responsibility to at least hold them and turn them over to ICE so that they can be then properly dealt with legally. It was really just that simple. Uh, it was a, our legal responsibility and duty to do that, and thank goodness we were able to get that passed. And it's so important because we can see in some other states who have sanctuary cities, sanctuary counties, to where they are simply going against our rule of law and it is creating havoc in those communities. We didn't want to bring that here to Florida. Okay. Representative Andrade? Uh, I, I think the, the, the difficulty in the Florida House was, uh, and this really was a good lesson in, in, in the process, right? Because the Florida House passed what it desired in immigration reform and the Senate passed what it desired in immigration reform and they differed. And they did have to bounce back and forth and that did lead uh, to the Florida House having a debate until uh, 2 a.m. on the House floor. Um, and, and a lot of that was, you know, Democrats wanting to, to voice their concerns about the overall national <clears throat> issues that they see in immigration. Uh, and I don't think anyone disagrees that we have to have merit-based immigration reform. We have to continue um, that discussion at the federal level. Um, but the question really was a fundamental one at the state level, and that's are we going to comply with whatever the federal government sets as immigration policy? And that's, that is the federal government's responsibility, and it's our responsibility to go along with it. Um, I think we made the right decision as a legislature, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to Governor DeSantis implementing what we, what we passed. Okay. Let me um, inform our viewers and our listeners that we would love to hear from you. Certainly you can call us at 484-1223 or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE, or if you prefer, you can email us, questions at WSRE.org. So anything that you might be interested in asking your legislator, please feel free to communicate with us and they will get the questions out to me and I will ask our legislators here on live television and radio. So you may see me bouncing around from topic to topic as various questions come in. This one's sort of environmentally driven here. What was the reasoning behind making sure no Florida city could pass its own law banning plastic bags and plastic straws? The viewer says this is a problem now and a five year wait means more pollution, more ocean waste, more landfill space taken, et cetera. And I'll begin with you, uh, Representative Hill. Sure, that was a bill that uh, originated over in the House um, to make sure that local municipalities, counties, cities, um, could not pass laws that would ban the use of plastic straws. Now, even though the issue was plastic straws, it was much broader <coughs> than that. And the broader issue was, it, will home rule apply? Will uh, those at the local level be able to determine how things are going to operate in their area? 
And for the most part, I agree with the home rule concept. Um, I will say that I believed in wanting to implement this ban on uh, having local municipalities, let me say it differently, having local municipalities who want to ban plastic straws, I agree with not allowing them to do that simply from a commerce standpoint. If there's uh, some local, let's, let's just use uh, Santa Rosa County. Let's say they want to ban it, but it's allowed in Escambia County and it's a, a, a food chain. So now they have to adjust their business operations and from one county to another, that increased costs. Now it increased costs to the consumer. So I thought that even though I am a proponent of home rule, when it comes to measures like this, which would affect the population overall in terms of perhaps increased costs because of what it does on businesses, then I was for not allowing them to ban plastic straws. Right. Representative Andrade? Uh, I, think, I think the distinction, and, and, and it's somewhat of a fun educational argument, right? Um, you know, should a local government be able to ban a product uh, in commerce? And obviously the Constitution allows you to do that. Um, the issue for me was the, the straw ban specifically didn't pass the SNF test, the rational basis test. Uh, there were studies that came out that said a ban on plastic straws would not um, help or improve the environment one way, in one way, shape, or form or another. Um, the big issue, the emotional issue, obviously across the country is that video of, you know, you see a sea turtle suffering um, from a plastic straw and everybody wanted to respond. Um, I think there's a difference between single-use plastics like plastic straws and single-use plastics like plastic bags, which we know harm our environment and clog up our, our sewer systems. I know the ECUA has to spend inordinate amounts of money dealing with that. And, and down the line, we'll have to have a discussion on how to address at the state level if the local governments abuse the powers that they have. Um, but the, the issue for, for plastic straws didn't pass the rational, rational basis test. The same way, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the fact that Key West thought it was a good idea to ban, to ban sunscreen on their beaches because there was, they, they claimed that there was some relationship between sunscreen uh, and, and the, the depletion in their coral reefs. Um, there was no scientific rationale for it, but they wanted to you know, have a knee-jerk reaction to claim that they were protecting their reefs and creating, you know, they were gonna create the melanoma capital of the world if mm -hmm. they banned you know, sunscreen on, in Key West. Yeah. Um, so it's always a balancing act in, in Tallahassee. Uh, we have some incredible local governments here in Northwest Florida uh, reminding people that, you know, we're a freedom-loving region of the state. Uh, we're not like a lot of local municipalities down in South Florida. It was something that you know we as Northwest Florida representatives do have to continue to remind people in Tallahassee. Senator Broxson, comment? I, I think the governor vetoed what we did, so I, he obviously had feelings about it, and we'll deal with it again next year. Yeah. You have to wonder, though, sort of on an issue like that, if that might be marketplace driven at some point in time, because if pe enough people decide that they don't like the idea of plastic straws and the marketplace will eventually perhaps pick yeah, up on that. That's absolutely what should happen. Uh, I will say that I don't think anybody disagrees that paper straws are awful. Yeah, They're so we'll see what happens on that. What is your opinion of the school guardian program, which allows school teachers to be armed? Beginning with you. Uh, so, so this year in the legislature, we passed a, a bill that would uh, add on to the, the school safety bill that was passed last year in response to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. Um, the, there was a commission formed by the state that said, let's look at best practices uh, to protect our students uh, to the best of our ability as a state. Uh, and that commission said that allowing uh, teachers and employees the, the opportunity to conceal carry if they so choose was something we should allow uh, school boards to decide. Uh, so this bill simply gave school boards the option to consider uh, allowing the employees in their school district to, to care concealed and protect the children in their, in their care. Um, this wasn't a mandate to arm teachers. Uh, this wasn't a requirement the school districts implemented. This was simply giving, especially the rural counties that, that do have highly trained uh, school employees, the opportunity uh, to, to, to protect their children in the way that they see fit and potentially save the school district money uh, you know, by, by not, having, not needing as many school resource officers. Um, it was, it was, this was an opportunity for us to give local control back, uh, and, I, and I was proud to vote for it. Senator Broxson? Well, I think uh, Representative Andrade said it well. Uh, it was an optional. We had to make that decision legislatively to give people permission. We're not a homogeneous state. We have uh, counties that, were, that are very rural. In some cases, it'd take 20 minutes to get an adequate force to deal with balance in some of these school districts. And we wanted these superintendents, these school boards, to make that decision themselves based on what was good for their county. It was not a mandate. We didn't force anything. There was, again, a lot of emotion around 
the, the horribles that we're trying to create and they just simply aren't there. It's to protect our kids the best way we can and provide the resources to do that. Okay. Representative Hill. Um, I agree with uh, both Senator Broxson and Representative Andretti that what came out of that Parkland shooting, the, the commission, uh, the study showed that if there had been an armed person there on the grounds, that that tragedy could have been mitigated, if not prevented altogether. Um, I was able to read the minute by minute uh, synopsis of what happened at that terrible tragedy. And it, it was horrible when you saw that there were certain teachers wanting to protect their students would actually throw their body in front of the, the armed shooter. If they had been able to be, have been armed, I'm sure that they would have used that weapon at the time. As I say, could have mitigated that tragedy quite a bit. Again, it is a voluntary program, um, it, and each county by county can decide whether or not they want to allow it into their district and then have the properly trained school administrators be able to carry to protect those children who they care for, they teach, and whom they love so much. Okay, very good. Um, did you support the change to medical marijuana laws that allowed marijuana to be provided in a smokable form? Why or why not? And um, I'll begin with you, Senator Brock. I did, and, and the fact is the constitutional amendment says that the people wanted that. And uh, the governor said that he wanted it. In fact, he said it had to be on his desk in early March. So there was, uh, we, we respected the governor, governor's opinion uh, I didn't particularly care for it. I think we're moving mi real fast on that issue, but uh, it is medical treatment. And look, uh, the world's changing, Florida's changing, and unfortunately we have to be involved in uh, when the people speak that we have to honor what they say. Okay, Representative Hill, your thoughts? Um, I, I was one of the few no votes in the House of Representatives. I think there were 11 of us all together who voted no. And I did vote no for that because I think even though that it was on the ballot where uh, uh, they wanted medical marijuana, it was not specific in that ballot initiative that it would be smokable. And I don't know of any drug that you smoke to make you feel better. Uh, and so I didn't think we as a legislative body should try and act like the FDA, that instead let the FDA do their job there are some parts of medical marijuana which are very good. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, I voted for medical marijuana, which would uh, come in oil form, which would be high in CBD, very low in THC, which causes the euphora, which helps stop intractable epilepsy uh, in children. I voted for that. But for this measure to say that um, smoke becomes, smoking marijuana becomes a uh, a medicine? Uh, no, I, I voted no for that. I didn't agree with it. Representative Andrade? Uh, I, I, I chose the same path that Senator Broxson did. I, you know, just I, I, I took a, uh, an approach that said if the Florida voters wanted it, then it's our responsibility to, to follow with what the Florida voters say the Constitution is. Um, and it's our responsibility not to not to infer our own our own biases, but to follow what the Constitution says. And um, the Constitution included the ability to smoke uh, marijuana in, in a medicinal sense. So we allowed it. Okay. We are taking your questions from our viewers and from our listeners. You can email us at questions, or I should say, just email questions at WSRE.org. Or if you'd like to call in your question and um, submit it to our producers off the air, they will give it to me. 850-484-1223 uh, is the local number or toll free at 1-800-239-WSRE. Uh, WSRE. So uh, feel free. We would love to hear from you. Here's another viewer slash listener question. Do you agree that Gulf power should be allowed to raise their rates so sharply? And if so, why? So I'll begin with you, Representative Andrade. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, when, you, when you say so sharply, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, the, in order to be a monopoly and a utility in the state of Florida, you're subject to the Public Service Commission. And the Public Service Commission is a body uh, that has to review every dime that you charge consumers in the state of Florida. Um, so if there's not a rational relationship between um, what they're charging you and what they're using that money for, um, then they're not allowed to charge that amount. 
Um, we did pass as a state, and we should have passed as a state this year, um, the ability for our utility companies um, to, to collect funds to actually make sure that we're hardened for hurricane seasons in the future because we know that it's it, uh, an ounce of prevention is a pound of cure. We saw it in Hurricane Michael, that entire systems had to get rebuilt. And so as a state, we need to take the responsible action to make sure that everyone, regardless of their financial wherewithal, will have a hardened system that they can rely on in the future the next time a hurricane hits the state of Florida. Uh, Senator Bronson? It was, unfortunately, it was a direct response what happened in Hurricane Michael. Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent that uh, these utilities do not have in the bank to do. So where do you get it from? You get it from the ratepayers, And it is a systematic way, hopefully an affordable way, that we could do it uh, over a period of years. Okay. Representative Hill? Without actually seeing the numbers that were presented to the Public Service Commission, it's hard to say whether or not they should or should not have. I do know that um, companies like Gulf Power and others build into their financial portfolio the situation of uh, mitigating for catastrophes that happen. I know there were other power companies that used the tax breaks that they had from the President Trump tax cuts. They used that instead of uh, increasing rates. But again, without seeing the numbers, perhaps that worked for that particular power company, and maybe it didn't for Gulf Power. So in order to say was it justified or not, it's hard to, see, hard to say. You have to kind of, as Representative Andretti said, rely on the Public Service Commission, who did see all the numbers, and they decided that it was justified. Okay. Uh, another viewer question here. What are your thoughts on allowing lower-cost prescription drugs to be imported from Canada? Representative Hill. Um, if it works, yes. You know, it, because what we want to do is, of course, control the cost of health care as much as possible. Now, some of the pushback that I've heard, and I'm not uh, aware of all the details, is that Canada is saying we don't have enough prescription drugs for our own population to even start considering sending it into other states. So it's really not a viable thing. The other pushback we heard is we might be not be able to control the uh, quality of those drugs that are coming in as we have here in the states. And so we might be getting some that are causing us more harm than others. But if it can be done in a smart way, if it can be done in a way that's going to lower health care costs, then I would be all for it. Okay. Representative Andrade? It's important to remember that this is a federal program that Florida's simply decided to take advantage of. Uh, the FDA is still going to have a role in making sure and certifying that the drugs that we're importing are, are safe and uh, we, we should be, you know, able to, to access them as American citizens and expect the same safety that we already enjoy uh, from the prescription drugs that we're able to access at our local CVS and Walgreens. Um, the, the big thing, and, and again what I'm proud of, is the, the bold steps we've taken as a state uh, towards becoming the cutting edge in healthcare across the country, not only with importing prescription drugs, but uh, with eliminating the, the certificate of need requirement uh, to, to start a new hospital, to, to incentivizing. Um, through regulation, not through tax incentives, uh, the ability for, for our local physicians to actually compete in a, in a fair and open market. Uh, and that should drive down costs and increase quality the same way it has in every other unregulated uh, level of medical care that we've seen across the country already. Senator Broxson? We already import 40% of our drugs from foreign countries. And we pay double what every other nation in the world pays just because we're Americans. It's unfair. It's dangerous because we built into this bill a safety net to make sure that the drugs that come in, that we can go to the factories and inspect, we inspect materials, we make sure that when they come here, they're right. The worst, and I think AARP uh, said it best, what's worse for people not to be able to take their medicine because they can't afford it, cut their pills in half, and go through horrible uh, problems medically because of drugs that they cannot afford. So they're going to be safe. Hopefully they're going to be cheaper and hopefully we're going to have people able to afford the medicine that doctors have prescribed to them. Mm -hmm. Here's another viewer question. Can the legislature strengthen Escambia County's non-binding referendum to ensure Pensacola Beach remains accessible and that it remains the property of the citizens? Representative Andrade. 
Uh, I think the bigger, the, uh, I think what the, the question gets at, at, the, at least at the state level, is the customary use regulations that we know in the state of Florida we have. Um, you know, to, there, there's a legal standard that you have to meet to establish that beaches uh, meet um, the customary use in the way that we already enjoy them. Uh, I don't think that's going to go anywhere here, here in Florida. Uh, we know that the beach is one of our biggest assets as a state, um, and, I, and I don't think that um, the customary use regulations that, that Florida already has are going to massively expand and allow people to fence off their beaches in specific counties. Okay. Representative, or Senator Broxson, I'm sorry. Well, we're very blessed here. We have an inordinate amount of uh, beachfront that's owned by the government, primarily on the beach. That will never be developed, both Fort Pickens and all the way down to Navarre. So we're talking about a very measured amount of property that uh, people want access to. And I believe we will always see that people have access to the beach. Uh, we, we've tried to deal with this issue. We've really kicked it back to the state. We've kicked it back to the federal government. And it's such a hot issue that no one really wants to take control of it. But I can assure people out there that they're going to have access to the beach. Okay. Representative Hill, no, no comment on that? Okay. Let's move on to a question uh, regarding Amendment 4, requiring ex-felons to pay cost fees, fines before voting. The uh, viewer uh, phrases it like this. She says an 11th hour change that you approved was to make ex-felons pay all of their court cost fees and fines and make restitution before they are allowed to vote. Um, goes on to comment, an ex-felon makes zero income when he or she is released, and yet you slap the face of 65% of the uh, Floridians who approved having ex-felons voting rights restored at no cost to them. Uh, your thoughts, and I'll, Representative Hill. Sure, well, I served on a Judiciary Committee, and um, this bill came before our committee. Even before the bill was presented to us, we had a panel of experts present to us um, what constitutes a sentence and completion of that sentence. And it's correct that Amendment 4 was passed by a supermajority of voters wanting to get that done, that once that a felon has completed their sentence, then that their voting rights would be restored. Well, you have to look at what is the completion of a sentence. And the completion of a sentence not only involves serving time, but it also involves re, uh, uh, restitution, paying the restitution, and paying uh, any court costs or civil penalties that are there. Now, what we were able to pass was legislation saying you do have to serve your court time and pay back your restitution, which is a part of your sentence. What was not included in that was anything that would have to be paid back to the government. Uh, any civil penalties or fines like that, that was, was removed, which I agreed with. So I did vote for that. I thought it was a great approach that restitution is a part of your sentence and that that should be completed before you have your voting rights restored. Representative Andrade. So uh, it's important to note that the organization that actually got this amendment on the ballot defined terms of sentence as time served, restitution paid, and court costs and fines paid as well. They did that and they included that on their website. And actually I signed the petition to put Amendment 4 on the ballot and I voted for Amendment 4 and I read the website that the organization Restor Restoration Florida put out and that's how they define terms of, the, of their sentence on their own website. Um, we did exactly what we had to do to meet the will of the voters as we understood it, as was defined by the organization that put this amendment on the ballot itself. This was not an 11th hour. We debated this for eight hours, I think, on the, on the Florida House floor. Um, and that's even before it went over to the Senate to get bounced back to us. We discussed this bill ad nauseum and we made sure that we met the will of the voters exactly where they actually showed us they were. And that, that's not just their website, Restore Florida. This was the Supreme Court argument made by the attorney hired by, by Restore Florida to actually get this amendment on the ballot. Uh, Dean Adams, he was, he, uh, he was a, a, a teacher of mine at UF Law. He made the argument for this organization at the Supreme Court level in Florida. And he defined terms of your sentence as restitution court costs paid. Um, it's important to know that all of these costs are reduced to a civil lien. Uh, we don't have debtors prisons in Florida. Uh, if they remain a criminal requirement, uh, people would be subject to going back to jail if they didn't pay them. That's not the case here in Florida. It's also important for us to remember that Amendment 6 was passed this, on the same ballot. Amendment 6, Marcy's Law, says that not only 
do felons have the right to vote in Amendment 4, but victims have the right to restitution. That's also ingrained in our Constitution after this past election. We had to balance those two rights when we, when we voted to implement this bill. Okay. Senator Broxson, comment? I would just say that constitutional amendments normally do not have a handbook with them on how you implement them, and that's the uh, duty of the legislature, and we do the very best we can to interpret the will of the people. Okay, very good. Having a wonderful discussion here with our local Northwest Florida legislative delegation, we would certainly like for you to be involved. Please feel free to email your question in or give us a call and our producers will uh, talk to you, get the question and they'll get it out to me. In the meantime, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a couple of moments. You are watching Legislative Review Dialogue with the Delegation on WSRE PBS for the Gulf Coast. WSRE offers its audience a variety of programs that we feel are important to our community. From one-on-one -on -one conversations, to the area's latest hot topics, to issues happening in Tallahassee. WSRE also provides in-depth discussions on diverse and academic matters as well. Viewing is easy. Check your local listing or watch us online at WSRE.org. Community-driven programs that affect you. Welcome back. You know, Legislative Review has been an integral part of programming here at WSRE. Your public television station has been providing this service for quite a while now. And as a matter of fact, you can see many previous episodes of Legislative Review online at WSRE.org. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity to spend some time and watch some of those back. Oh, it's kind of interesting to go back over the years and, and watch those and see how things have changed and evolved. Well, just when we thought we were over plastic straws, we're back. <laughs> so a viewer uh, asked the question, uh, he or she says, I am a Republican, but I think localities should be able to ban plastic straws. Is your opposition based on contribution slash influence uh, coming from Florida Association uh, Industries Pact? No. Okay. Uh, and, and you're in luck because Governor DeSantis uh, vetoed the bill. And so we have not banned banning plastic straws in Florida. Uh, okay. Any other commentary on that? Or that's enough plastic, we're out of the plastic straw business for now? Okay, here's a, kind of an interesting um, question. What are the topics being planned for the 2019 Fall Interim Committee weeks in September? Any idea? <laughs> well, um, the, the schedule for those weeks just came out uh, very recently. Uh, leadership on both the House and Senate side is going to start setting that agenda. I'm not quite sure it's been set yet, um, I will say that I'm pretty sure that some legislation which was not passed this past session is going to be coming back again. I, I think we can see that. I, I can't speak for my colleagues here, which they may be bringing back, but I know that for myself, I'm going to be bringing back the heartbeat detection bill. Um, I want to make that a priority for next session. We're seeing a movement across the heartland of Florida right now where pro-life seems to be taking a hold of this nation, that there's a great pushback against what we've been seeing since 1972 in this nation, the abortion holocaust. And so I'm definitely going to be bringing that back uh, next session, along with the uh, legislation to protect our veterans and memorials, our veterans and soldiers, memorials and monuments. Uh, I'll be bringing that back again next session. All right. Representative Andrade? Uh, well, I'll... You know, I'm considering what six bills you get. You're allowed to run six general bills in addition to any committee bills you're assigned and down the line. Um, this past session, I was lucky enough to pass nine bills off the House floor, and six of them had Senate companions. Uh, so I'm going to have to go find other bills to, to be working on. Uh, I'm passionate about criminal justice. I'm proud of what the, the Florida House especially did this year and, you know, raising the felony uh, theft amount from $300, which was set in the 1980s, to, to 1000 on at least on the House side, and it ultimately became 750 uh, you know, in conjunction with the Senate. Uh, I think you're going to see more health care reform from the Florida House. I think our speaker, Jose Oliva, is passionate about health care, he's passionate about higher ed, and he's passionate about school choice. And I think he's going to continue uh, working for those and working for deregulation. Um, Governor DeSantis has made no qualms about his desire for a deregulation bill to, to, to drive down the barriers to entry to, to enter trades here in the state of Florida. And we had a, uh, a bold bill um, that ultimately failed, unfortunately. Uh, in the legislature this year, and I think it's going to be coming back, uh, and we'll be we'll be working that again uh, this next session. Mm -hmm. Senator Broxson? 
One of the things that really was disturbing the entire session was the fact the federal government did not respond to Hurricane Michael. We had, and unfortunately, it was leverage between what was going on in Puerto Rico. The president said two weeks ago that we spent over $82 billion there, and we've spent somewhere around a billion for Panama City that they predict is going to be a 20 to $30 billion storm. They responded to Katrina in seven days, Superstorm Sandy in two weeks. It's been two, over 200 days since we've gotten a reasonable response from Congress on what they're gonna do with Hurricane Michael. It is a disgrace that the people of this area have been treated the way that they've been treated by the federal government. And this is gonna be an issue that comes up early in the session of what reimbursements we've gotten what is the status of those folks that have been devastated in those, those counties? And what is the state re responsibility to step up and be more than just friends, but be good neighbors and getting those people back on their feet? Okay, very good. Um, what are the implications of tax cuts on state services? So there were some rather robust tax cutting uh, or tax cuts that, that will occur. Um, how the, the viewer is asking, how will that affect state services? And uh, I, I'm, I'll begin with you, I believe, Senator Brock. So I'm trying to keep everybody I'm, I'm in order. I'm trying to, you know, this year, we, we've cut so many taxes in the last 10 years since, since I've been in the legislature over $4 billion of taxes. Uh, there were some cuts, but it certainly was not at the same degree that we've seen in the past. So I don't know exactly what they're speaking of, uh, other than uh, there were certainly no tax increases, but I don't believe there was a lot of taxes that were cut uh, this year that, that uh, would believe, be similar to what we've seen in am, the past years. Am, am I mistaken? Was there perhaps a little bit cut off of uh, maybe business rents and yes. then also extending, uh, I believe, the extension of some tax-free um, holidays for school supplies as well as disaster preparation? Am I right? No, you're, you're absolutely right. We reduced uh, the commercial lease tax by another 0.2 percent. I believe it's at 5.5 percent from 5.75 percent. Um, one of the, the, the best things to the, the viewer's question uh, is that our one constitutional requirement is to pass a balanced budget. And uh, in order to do that, we have revenue estimating conferences to tell us how much money we have to work with. And the state of Florida is still going gangbusters. We're the 16th largest economy in the world. Um, we're, we're growing by leaps and bounds every day. Um, and we're, we're not short on revenue. And that does allow us to be a very low tax state. Um, so, so no, I don't think our services are going to be reduced by any of the taxes that we reduce because we'd potentially put ourselves in a position of, of not balancing our budget. Um, but we are going to continue finding opportunities to reduce the tax burden on Florida citizens. Okay. Any other commentary? Well, I, I would agree in, in that of that $91.1 billion, when we re reduce that commercial lease tax by that minuscule 0.25%, I think it was, uh, that hardly had an effect on what it's going to mean in services uh, for our citizens. However, I would like to have seen that commercial lease tax cut even more. Florida is the only state in the nation which has a commercial lease tax. Uh, it, that is a company that wants to come in here, they're leasing space, and now they have to pay a tax on that lease space. Uh, imagine how much more our economy could be driven by commerce if we could get rid of that lease tax. And then reducing the, the or implementing the taxes on the tax holidays, that simply helps consumers. So I don't think we're gonna see any reduction in our services uh, at all. Of that 91.1 billion, and we spent 37.7 billion on healthcare. Uh, we spent close to 25 billion on education. And then uh, it was 15 billion, I think it was, on transportation. So uh, no, we're not seeing any services that are being cut in the state of Florida because of some of the small tax cuts that we had this past session. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Representative Andrade mentioned the fact that Florida is growing and growing rapidly, so we are now the third largest state behind uh, California, Texas, now Florida. We surpassed New York, I think about a year, year and a half, two years ago, somewhere in that ballpark. Is there any talk in Tallahassee of, of concern that perhaps we are growing too fast and getting ahead of ourselves? Does, does that come up or do we feel pretty comfortable um, as a legislative body that, that we can handle this as a state? So uh, I think one of the best examples of the fact that our population uh, is, at least has to be a consideration, is the fact that we're suffering larger uh, blue-green algae events in central Florida and Lake Okeechobee. 
um, you know, people people want to blame industry, but one of the biggest contributors to to the the discharge, the 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 nutrient buildup in Lake O, is the fact that over 50% of Florida residents still live on septic tanks. And so when that when that water gets uh, diverted to either the Caloosahatchee or the St. Lucie rivers, um, it's running along residential areas that are largely on septic tanks. And one of the biggest things this year we did um, was fund a, a heavily aggressive Everglades friendly environmental uh, plan uh, of over $400 million for, for restoration and environmental concerns in Central Florida. Um, so, so while no, it's a great thing to have our population growing and you know, those northern states, high tax states, please bring your pensions down here. I think Adam Putnam <laughs> said, you know, Florida is a reward for a life well lived elsewhere. Um, we absolutely need to have those, those residents coming back down here. Um, we just got to plan for it and be responsible as, as responsible stewards of both our environment and our economy. Okay. Any commentary? Well, I, I think we obviously know that we have great water issues in South Florida and we've got to deal with that. I think Governor DeSantis has made that commitment. The question that is now being heard that I've never heard in 10 years is that we've depended on 67 counties to determine who is on septic and who's on sewer. That may quickly becoming a state responsibility that we have to make sure that we have uniformity from Santa Rosa, Scambia, Santa Rosa, all the way down to Monroe, that uh, we have some stake in what happens as far as septic tank and sewer. And I believe the state's willing to look into that more next year. Okay. Yes, and we are growing at a rate of about a thousand new residents a day from moving to Florida. And something that was passed this past legislative session was uh, to expand our highway system. In fact, there's going to be three new highways which are going to be built in Florida, which is going to help mitigate uh, the traffic congestion and take care of all those who are moving into our area. So, no, I, I would not agree with uh, the viewer who thought that perhaps uh, we may not be able to handle all those who are coming in. We can, and we're moving progressively in that area. Now, what I would say, and we kind of talked about this previously before we came on camera, is that we know where those people are coming from who are moving to our states primarily. They're coming from the high tax states, such as uh, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Illinois. They're moving into our areas. Uh, but unfortunately, when they come here to enjoy our low tax status, they're bringing their high tax thoughts with them as they come here. And so the things that they're fleeing from, they seem to be bringing those thoughts with them here. So I, I think a solution not only of mitigating our septic tank sewers and so forth and um, uh, building more highways, I think we need to build a wall. We need to build a wall <laughs> and vet those who are coming from those high tech states and, and see how, how did they vote on certain issues before we let them in. Okay. Uh, let's shift gears over to teacher shortage. Uh, viewer writes in last year, Florida started with 4,000 teacher vacancies and is projected to start the coming school year with more than 10,000 vacancies. The, um, the viewer says the legislature did not address teacher pay, but instead voted a complicated bonus that many teachers will not be able to attain because it is tied to school scores and principal recommendations. Uh, what will legislators do to adequately address the teacher shortage? And, and I guess from a compensation standpoint as well. So, uh, you know, this year in the Florida legislature, we did, you know, in conjunction with the governor, uh, address what a lot of people considered an unfair bonus system in the past, you know, best and brightest. We, we work to, to, we're working to make it more fair as a legislature. What we also did, and what is a conservative principle, is, is, is implementing school choice across the state. The voters, the voters have indicated very clearly that they, they want the opportunity to choose what's best for their child, and that money should go with the child. Um, this year in the Florida legislature, we allowed for 18,000 more students in Florida uh, to, to go to a school of their choice, to, to take control of their own education plans. Um, while there's still more to do, I think that we have to make sure that teachers can return to work uh, after retirement in less than a year when there's a shortage. Um, we're, we're working on it. We increased the base student allocation, I believe, by over $300 this year. Uh, that's a huge step forward and should allow for, for more funds to go to those schools. Um, but it's always going to be a, a balance and a tug of war between um, special interests and, and what's best for the child. And we have to go make and wrestle with that decision every day in Tallahassee. Commentary? Well, we, we spend about $8,600 a year per student. And 
most of that comes from local ad valorem taxes. So mm -hmm. the state Department of Education certainly has a play in local school boards and superintendents, how they spend their money, but most of it comes from local government. Okay. And just kind of a follow up on that, here's another viewer that was kind of, uh, shall we say, piggybacking <coughs> on that, wanting to know why, you know, well, she says, uh, can you please answer why you were voting to cut funding for public schools while giving more money to charter school vouchers, especially when these schools, uh, speaking of the charter schools, I guess, uh, do not have the same accountability? Well, first of all, we didn't cut funding for public schools. As uh, Senator Broxson said, we actually increased it. It may not have been as much as some wanted or as we would have uh, wanted ourselves to do because there, we do have to do a, a balanced budget. Um, but it was increased. And what I would also let the viewer recognize is that charter schools are public schools and that the more that we have in terms of school choice, whether it be charter schools home school, virtual school, private schools, the better our education system is going to be because competition always creates more excellence in a system. And so uh, I, I think we're moving in the right direction with our education system. It's never going to be enough. Uh, it, it's ne uh, we could raise our, our, our teachers' pay raises by $1,000 a year, $3,000 a year, and it won't be enough because there's always that insatiable demand to want to have more. Um, but I do believe we're moving in the right direction for increasing our teachers' pay. Well, one of the, the fact is that charter schools get less reimbursement than the public schools by about $1,000. But if you ask any realtor in this area, what's the first question that a person, a family will ask when they're bringing their children into an area? Tell me about the schools. Mm -hmm. They want their students to be educated and to be safe and we're giving people the opportunity to make sure that their students are educated and safe it's not near the issue it is here in the panhandle we have real deep problems in the more populated part of the states of the state and uh, we unfortunately when we pass laws it doesn't just affect our district it affects 67 counties and sometimes we get in on short end of the stick on some of these this litigate at some of this legislation 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 any more commentary on that just on a part of her question too she was saying that maybe that uh, charter schools are not held as accountable is that true or not true she's not incorrect uh, char charter schools are, are not, they, they don't undergo the same supervision that, that public schools do. But part of that is to allow charter schools to engage in the marketplace of ideas and implement new policies and ideas that might work better for a different child. Uh, that doesn't mean it's perfect, and there are going to be examples of bad actors. We've had bad actors in charter schools here in Escambia right. County. We've seen that firsthand. Uh, but that doesn't mean philosophically it's a bad idea. Uh, it just means we have to continue to learn. Uh, and to continue making sure that what we decide in Tallahassee is what's best for the child. Okay. Um, do you support a swift death penalty for school shooters? That, that's a, a, a loaded question, no pun intended. Um, but those who commit heinous crimes should go through our judicial process, that whole procedure, and whatever is decided by a jury or by a court is what we should abide by. Now, do I think that it should be uh, swifter uh, justice than what we've seen in the past? Uh, I would think so. I, I think that our appeal process might be too cumbersome, too long. I, I know just recently we had a uh, convicted murderer who Governor DeSantis uh, was able to sign his, uh, his uh, death sentence and appeals were made to the Supreme Court, which were denied for a crime that took place, I think, in 1984. So uh, when it goes that long, it, it is a bit, I think, uh, too cumbersome and needs to be fixed. Any other commentary? Uh, I'm, you know, it might be controversial or uncomfortable to talk about, but I'm pro-life. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm even pro-life when it comes to the death penalty here in the state. And that comes, that, that, that decision and that position comes from the fact that it is so incredibly expensive to, to put someone to death in this country. And that's because we value due process in this country. And that's a, that's, that's a value that I hold very dear. And that's not something I want to jeopardize. But because of that due process requirement and that protections that we provide uh, to people on death row, it is less costly to have someone in a state facility than it is to put them to death. So what are we actually doing? 
What are we actually doing as good stewards of your taxpayer dollars if we pursue doggedly uh, the death penalty for every single person who commits a death penalty qualifying crime in the state of Florida? Right now there are state attorneys who they're too afraid to say it because they're politically elected as well, um, but it's costly and they would much rather give the money that they have to spend pursuing the death penalty for raises for their state attorneys and even for public defenders and for the investigators in their offices. This is a conversation that we should absolutely be having as a state. Um, if, we are, if we claim to be pro-life, we should be considering ourselves pro-life across the board and we should start thinking of this as a conservative principle. Senator Broxton, any comment here? Okay. Um, we're getting short on time, so I am going to uh, speed these up a little, a little bit so we can get some more in. Um, a viewer says the Public Service Commission has become ineffective regarding setting rates. How can we um, salvage this situation? Well, I don't know. That, that's kind of a blanket statement that is not based on fact, to my knowledge. I think they're responsible and do based, uh, they make decisions based on information. Okay, very good. Any other comment? Okay, on that. Um, here, here's one. Thank you for your support of the arts. Will you continue that support in the future? I'll do everything in my power to support the arts. I think, uh, you know, I represent the city of Pensacola and we have a, a, a vibrant arts community. Uh, so finding opportunities, if we have the money in our balanced budget to provide it, uh, is something that I, th I think we should absolutely pursue. Okay, very good. Let's talk about health care here. What are you doing to fix health care for all Floridians instead of just voting to get rid of it? Uh, do you support expanding Medicare in Florida? I think they probably meant Medicaid in Florida. Well, let, let's be frank. A third of our budget is spent on health care now. It's the fastest growing part of our budget every year. It's involuntary. We have to spend it to take care of the poor and take care of the elderly. And it's a cost that if we don't get control of, it will eat into the other budget items such as education, transportation, and all the quality of life issues that uh, the reason that people live in Florida. So we're doing more every year on health care than we did before because it's mandated that we have to. And it, it's an unfortunate part of our budget that we have to to spend so much of it, but uh, that's what we've done and that's what we'll continue to do. Okay. Let me jump to the next question here because this was kind of uh, interesting. Um, what is your opinion of House Bill 107, which allows police officers to pull over drivers they see texting behind the wheel? And just a little um, footnote on that, as I understand it before, you could not be pulled over for texting, but you could be charged for it if you were pulled over for something else. So that's changed or is in the process of changing. Is that yeah. correct? The, the big distinction between the law that we passed last year and the law that we passed this year is the fact that we've now made it a primary offense, meaning that if you see someone texting, you can pull them over. That has to be balanced uh, with your Fourth Amendment right to privacy. Uh, in Florida, we have a, even a higher level of privacy. You have the right to be let alone in our Florida Constitution. Um, so I'm curious to see uh, how this is going to be implemented because how do you prove someone was texting and not using their map or you know, fiddling on their Spotify app on their phone? Um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll cross those bridges, I guess, when we come to them. Well, I, I voted no against that. Uh, I think I was the only no vote in the Florida House on making texting a primary offense because I believe we already have in place uh, laws against that. It's called reckless driving, it's called careless driving, it's called distracted driving. But to uh, charge someone with a crime essentially is what it is before a crime has been committed, before they've uh, cause any injury to themselves or someone else, uh, I think is an overreach of government. I would disagree with that statement, simply because we you know, arrest people for drunk driving and it's proven that text, texting while driving is just as dangerous, if not more, than, than drunk driving. Okay. What, what texting is a big issue. I mean, we're, we're having a lot more accidents and, and deaths because primarily young people are ignoring the law. So what do we do to strengthen their incentive to make sure they're not texting? Okay, real quick here, um, what was done with Triumph Gulf Coast money this session, any of it used for Hurricane Michael recovery efforts? And I'll have to ask each of you to make it quick. <laughs> there, there was, uh, we allowed the counties that were impacted to take money that was already going to them, part of their 5%, to use it for, uh, to build back the coffers in the local government to make sure they can function as a government and as a city. Okay. 
I have about a minute and a half. I'll get each one of you, if you'll just give me about 30 seconds, kind of what you're most optimistic about as we sail on through the rest of the 2019 here. Representative Hill? Sure, yeah. Uh, as I stated earlier, um, I believe that there is a movement now across our nation to protect life, uh, the preborn, and so I will be bringing back the heartbeat detection bill. I believe it's going to pass this time. Um, Representative Andrade said that he is pro-life, uh, even for those who deserve the death penalty. So I would encourage him this time to be a sponsor of my heartbeat de detection bill, even though he wasn't last time. Right. Uh, Representative Andrade. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know Representative Phil. Um, you know, uh, you know I was able to pass nine bills off the House floor. I can give Representative Phil some tips and pointers on passing bills if he needs them. Um, but no, I'm optimistic about this coming year. I'm optimistic about the fact that we were able to play nice with the Senate and the House and the governor. And I think we're going to continue passing bold legislation and having the governor sign bold legislation that makes Florida the cutting edge state that it deserves to be. Okay. And Senator Broxson. I, I do think that uh, Florida, along with many states, were offended by what happened in New York. And there's an optimism that we have a more conservative Supreme Court. And I, too, will co-sponsor or sponsor a bill that deals with the abortion issue that uh, hopefully the Supreme Court will, will, will deal with it once and for all. Okay, very good. Well, gentlemen, we so, so greatly appreciate you coming in and spending some time with us. And, and, and I know it, it takes some scheduling to do that, to get all of you together, but uh, it's greatly appreciated by those of us here at WSRE Television, along with our media partners over at News Radio. And uh, it's certainly appreciated by your constituents and our viewers and our listeners. So thank you very much. I hope you guys have a great summer and have fun. And we'll see you back here. Uh, we'll get a little pre-session 2020, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll look forward to that. So thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate our legislators spending time with us this evening. We also appreciate you, our viewers, our listeners, our constituents, for all the great questions that you sent in. Our guests this evening have been members of our local Northwest Florida legislative delegation, Senator Doug Broxson and Representatives Mike Hill and Alex Andrade. Due to scheduling conflicts, Senator Gaynor and Representative uh, Jayer Williamson and Mel Ponder were unable to join us. Hopefully we'll get them back next time. They always generally make it. Um, tonight's broadcast has come to you from the Phyllis and Mike Johnson studio over the television airwaves of WSRE TV, PBS for the Gulf Coast, and also News Radio 92.3 FM and AM 1620. By the way, this program will be available soon online at WSRE.org as well as on YouTube. Please feel free to share. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you have a great spring and a wonderful summer and go out there and enjoy all the beautiful sunshine state of Florida has to offer. Good night, everyone. We'll see you soon.